Father, we just thank you so much. I think he's here many times that he could be where you are right now, except for the grace of God. And yet today, God has transformed his life, and he's going to be able to share the message of hope, the message of the gospel to you. So I welcome Derek with you. You know me. I've been coming for a few years. You know that I'm blunt, straight in your face, and I tell it like the Lord tells me to tell it. Um, I spare no punches. I had a message that I was going to deliver. I, I attended Bobby, Bobby's uh, wedding last Saturday. And David, sitting up here in the front row, David, could you stand up one second? David intercepted me and told me his story. That he had fallen many times. He had come to Christ and he had fallen. He had come to Christ and he had slipped. And he was wondering whether he was truly saved. And he figured out this time, this last time, he finally gave up and he gave himself to the Lord and said, I'm tired of this. I want you to change me. And the Lord changed me. So I have a question. I'm, I would always, you can always count on me being two things, honest and transparent with you. My, my life in darkness for 55 years is an open book. I have no shame because that is how I used to live. I'm a different person now. I have been born again. By show of hands, how many of you in here, and I need you to be honest, how many of you in here believe in God the Father? And then now I need you to be just as honest. How many of you in here believe that Jesus Christ is his son and through Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven? How many of you believe that? Good. See, my answer, my prayers were answered. The Holy Spirit led me into another discussion for tonight. A lot of you guys have been here off and on. I've seen all these faces over and over and over. And I've often wondered... You sit here and you hear the gospel over and over and over, and it looks like, so for many of you, your hearts are hardened. You don't hear the word anymore. You're here for an hour waiting to get fed. Then I look at the others who have accepted Christ sometime in their life, but then I look at, I don't see any joy in their face. I don't see any rejoicing in the way they walk. I feel frustration. I feel anger, and I feel hopelessness, and I'm wondering, how can you be like that if you've given your life to Christ? But you know what? Matthew 7, 21 23 states, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In these verses, Jesus does not say it's just a few misguided souls that have a false hope of heaven. Jesus says there's going to be many. We all know that the road to heaven is narrow. So that means, look in this room. By numbers, not many of us are getting through. But let's maybe can change that tonight. We can maybe change that. He is, he is talking to people who think that they are Christian, born again. Jesus exposed people who sounded religious but had no personal relationship with him. On Judgment Day, only our relationship with Christ, our acceptance of Him as Savior, and also our obedience to Him as our Lord will matter. Jesus is more concerned about our walk, not our talk. Amen. He wants us to do right, not just say the right thing. Let me put my glasses on here because I'll just a little Professed believers are people who think that they are going to make it into the glory based on their lip service. And we hear that a lot. Oh yeah, I believe in God. Oh yeah, I'm saved. Yeah, I'm going to heaven. They have no idea what they're talking about. In James 2.17, in the same way, faith 
made by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, I'm not saying you are truly saved, that you can lose your salvation. Maybe you can't. Already. What I'm saying is, are you truly saved? I know he's been your provider. I know That's he's the question for most of us in here who profess to be Christian. Are we truly we saved? To, the full to be a Christian, he is because he's just truly born right. again, you must know, repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and obey His word. Repent means I am leaving the old life behind for a new one. We're not talking about a new appendage. We're not talking about a makeover. We're talking about a total destruction of an old way of living and acceptance of a new way. It is a complete makeover, destruction of the old and the birth of the new. Believe means I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am compelled to live under his command. This is the only name that will lead you. Obey me. And so if you without doing what the Lord says in his word, James said that devils believe and tremble at the name of Jesus. But that doesn't make them change their behavior. Saving belief is more than acknowledgement of the doctrines of the Lord. You must obey his word. Yeah, I wrote this on the side small, so you got to hear me. John 2, 3, 4 states, We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That is the truth. In John 8, 31, 32, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Basically, if Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Master, He cannot be your Savior. They both work hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Believers are not saved by their works. But, we, but when we are saved, our life will constantly reflect the decision by our good works. You see what I'm saying? My works do not save me. But because I'm saved, I do good works. Because I'm compelled to do it. Sinners. The sinner's prayer by itself does not save. Let's get that clear. Just because you say a bunch of words, no mystical thing comes over you and saves you. The prayer is a confession of belief on the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. Because we truly believe we keep on reading and obeying God's word. But God, and God is helping us to obey and walk uprightly by indwelling all believers with the Holy Spirit. And believe me, if you are a true believer, you know the Holy Spirit. A gift from God to every true believer. A believer's salvation is a Him, and that Him being Jesus Christ. John 6, 28, 29 states. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. Now what does that entail? Having truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the true believer will naturally do what Christ says, follow his word. Salvation is not about doing a series of good works that a man thinks is good, no, God forbid. Salvation is about Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe, have faith in Christ, and that is why we obey Him. As we obey Christ, the Holy Spirit helps us to obey, and we are changed. And you know what? Even our desires are changed. For those who say, I can't give my life to Christ, I don't want to stop drinking. I don't want to give my life to Christ because I like that crap. I don't want to give my life because I just like sex for sex. I'm telling you, when you give your life to Christ, it's only a matter of time if you're a true believer and you are in the Word and you are trying to learn about your Lord Jesus Christ that your desires will change. It's a natural step like growing up. You can't help it. You don't change anything in your life unwillingly. You do it willingly. The Bible says that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. This fear of the Lord will cause a true believer to repent and, and to depart from evil and not embrace it. If you're a true believer, your life will demonstrate. It will show fruit. The Bible tells us this over and over. You are judged by the fruit that you produce. 
We believers are on the earth in order to serve the Lord. That's why we're here. There's no other reason. We don't serve ourselves. We don't serve our families. We're here to serve the Lord. What's going on in this election cycle? To a true believer, who cares? The Lord is in control of everything. We keep focusing on the Lord because all of our answers and hopes lie in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Remember that. We read God's word and we start making changes. But you know what it takes? It takes action. It takes you to take action. Then the Lord will come alongside you. When he knows you're not shepherd and giant. When he knows you're serious. When he knows you want to change. That's when you change. Right. By the fear of the Lord, believers depart from evil. When believers walk toward God's word, they are at the same time leaving evil. Second Timothy. Ooh, I almost made a Donald Trump thing. Two Timothy. No. Second Timothy 2.21 states that if a man purges himself from evil, works, and habits, he shall be met. He shall meet for the master's use and be prepared for every good work. See, the only way we're going to do that is we have to, we got to seek the word. It's not going to just come into your mind, you sitting there and rely on the Lord to do all the work. The Lord has provided you with a precious gift, eternal life. you got to put some kind of effort in. you got to read the word. you got to get to know what the word is. you got to know who the Lord is. you got to be able to obey. Unsaved people do what they feel like doing. The devil allows that. Same people are under the Lord's command. That is the big difference, guys. Tonight we're going to talk about people in here who are professed believers. Because you know what? A lot of times we forget you guys. We forget the ones that maybe doubt their salvation. Maybe doubt whether they are truly saved. Well, let me give you some points of evidence that you can examine yourself and determine for yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit, whether you are indeed saved. Because if you are, salvation is yours. But the point I'm trying to make is that for many of us, we're just talking to talk. Let's go over some of these evidence that the true believer in Jesus Christ possesses. And all of this can be found in the Gospel, 1 John, chapter 1 through 4, most of it's contained. Number one, thank you. Number one, submissive respect, realizing who we really are, that we're sinners, in dire need of salvation. 1 John 1 8 and 10 states, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess all sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have no sin, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. In admitting that we have sinned, we will continue to sin because we have flesh to deal with, we have Satan to deal with. Remember, God has allowed Satan to rule this earth. But it's all in God's control. In admitting our sins and receiving Christ's cleansing, we are agreeing with God that our sin is truly sin, and that we are willing to turn from it. That means turn from it. That means make an attempt to leave sin behind. Ensuring that we don't hide our sins from God and consequently from ourselves. And that's the problem. If we don't deal with our sins and hold ourselves accountable, who we, who we, who we lie to? God knows the truth. We lie to ourselves. We have to become accountable. You have to look in the mirror as a man, as a woman, and say, you know what? I'm sinning. I'm the epitome of sin. I'm not worth the crap. That the only way that I can gain righteousness is through Jesus Christ and following His Word. Ensuring that we don't hide ourselves from God and, and, consequent, and consequently from ourselves, as I said. And recognizing our tendency to sin and relying, but we have to rely on His power to overcome it. We can't do it on our own. That's why you need to be in the book. You have to be in the Word. You have to gain a fear for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Here are my questions for you. And then you answer these between you and the Holy Spirit. Do you respect God and His total authority? Is your opinion just as important or even more relevant than God's? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? 
Not just your Savior, but is He your Lord? Number two point, evidence. Scripture obedience. Study the God. Study God's Word. 1 John 2, 5 states, But if anyone obeys His Word, God's love is truly made complete in Him. And this is how we know we are in Him. My question for you, do you read the Bible daily? Do you bother to pick it up, open it up, and read it? Do you truly have a love for the Word? Do you read the words seeking to obey what you find, or do you read it as a fairy tale? Just to occupy time and get you to sleep. And do you, in the end, do you submit yourself to God's word? And that's what the important thing is. Do you give in to God's word and obey? Or do you obey yourself and the earthly desires around you and Satan's whispering in your ear? What do you do? Those are questions you have to answer. The third point. Societal rejection. Be not of the world. 1 John 2, 15, 17 states. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and his desires pass away, only temporarily. But the man who does the will of God will live forever. Knowing that this evil world will end can give a true believer the courage to deny himself of those temporary pleasures of the world in order to focus on what God has promised him, eternity. Remember, we're talking about maybe if we're lucky 80, 90 years on this earth, Compare that to eternity. Ladies and gentlemen, compare that to eternity. That's everlasting, you're right. That's forever. For what? Remember, if it's so valuable, can you take it with you? I don't know anybody who leaves this earth, but, but, but maybe. You don't take your Cadillac, you don't take all your money and your gold, it gets to go to somebody else when you're gone. That's how valuable that is, huh? That's how valuable God thinks it is. The only thing He wants is you. Question for you to answer. Do you love and seek the world, its money and its possessions? Do you mean more, do they mean more to you than Jesus Christ and his approval? But the most important question is for everybody to ask, to call upon, would you give it up today? Would you walk away from your house, your car? Would you walk away from all those things today if the Lord says, I need you to do this? That's the question. That's the commitment. How much are you in the Lord? Or is it just superficial? You see, now you know why, you're beginning to realize why the road to Christ is so narrow. That's the question that the, that's the, question that the rich man asked the Lord. He said, you got to give it all. you got to give it all up. And he walked around, he walked away with his head down. He couldn't do it. The fifth point. Jesus' is second coming. 1 John 3, 2, 3 says, But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has his hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. That's sanctification. That's the walk we believers do. From the, from the day we're saved to the day we meet the Lord, face to face. And then only then is our road of sanctification complete. Until then, we're striving for purification. We're trying to be holy as the Lord is holy. Questions to you. Are you willing? Are you living in the daily awareness that Jesus Christ will return for his own? Are you eagerly looking forward to his coming for you? Does your daily life reflect the fact that he may come today, tonight? But more importantly, question yourself. Are you ready to meet the Lord Jesus right now? Can you look at him eye to eye without shame and self condemnation Can you do that? That's a question for a believer that we have to answer. Next point, six. Sin, sensitivity, conviction by the Holy Spirit. 1 John 3, 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Here, John is not talking about believers 
who have yet got total control over sin or victory over sin because that's incomplete. He is talking about the people who, who make the practice of sinning, sinning a continuous track and look for ways to justify it. All the believers still sin. All believers still sin. But they are working to gain victory over sin. And I can say seven years, three months ago I gave up a 30 year addiction. Okay? It took me that long to face what I had to do. And that's looking in the mirror, reading the word, and realizing that I wasn't right. That I was fooling myself. And none of the excuses, but this and all of them. Question. Does sin bother you? Do you truly wish you sin less than you do? Are you sinning less now than you did when you first were called? Do you enjoy your sin? Does it affect your happiness? Do you realize ultimately that God sees every sin, large and small, that nothing escapes, that we're going to get a painful replay when we become before Him? Quickly, I will go over sibling love, love for your fellow believers. Do you love your fellow believers? Or do you love your worldly friends more? That's a question that you have to ask. Do you enjoy being in their company more than you would a believer? And are your dearest friends fellow believers? Supplications. And basically we're talking about prayer. Do you pray? You know, as believers now, we have the ability to approach God as friends. Not as some mysterious figure that we have to go through a priest or through a saint to get to. When Jesus died, the curtain to the holiest of holy was torn from the top down, indicating that it was done by God, not by man. He gave us the opportunity at that time to come to Him face to face whenever we have a problem. Do you pray? Do you pray regularly? Do you point? Do you, can you point to the specific answers of your prayer and know that God was the only one that could have answered that prayer for you? Do you find yourself conversing with God on a regular basis as if He is your friend? These are some of the questions. And there's other points. But realize you have the Holy Spirit in you that makes you aware and helps you seek God's Word and to seek a healthy fear of God, realizing who He is. Because believe me, if you are fortunate enough to be saved, the day that you come face to face with God, I know what I'm doing. I'm hitting that earth face first and trying to dig my face, trying to dig a hole. Because I'll realize at that moment, Oh my God. Stand up. I get what I ask you tonight. Stand up if you want to reaffirm your belief in, the, in, the, in, the, in Jesus Christ as both your Lord and Savior. Stand up. Don't be ashamed. If you think you're a believer and tonight you, you might question that, do you want to reaffirm that? Do you have the courage? Right now, you may not know from certain, for certain whether you are covered over under God's grace. But you can make certain right now. Renew your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So what you're telling me is the rest of you that are in this room and are believers, you are so certain that you are in Christ. You got up this morning and you worked for Christ all day. You didn't cuss. You didn't think badly of anybody else. You didn't you didn't desire some earthly thing, booze, sex, drugs. Can you, can you truly say that? Why do I ask you to stand and proclaim your reaffirmation of allegiance to Jesus Christ before other people here? Because everyone Jesus called out, he did in public. And as Matthew 10, 32, 33 states, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him to my Father in heaven. But it goes the other way. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. You're not going to have the whole way, ladies and gentlemen. Genuine discipleship always involves acknowledgement of Jesus Christ, whether or not we are being pressured or, or, or persecuted. Remember, it's not like Donald Trump being asked, what is your favorite verse? And his reply was, that's a private between me and the Lord. Oh boy. You guys, I'm inviting you after tonight, we're out of time, to come up here 
I've got a New Testament for you. I've got some stuff for you to ensure that you can get back into the Word and stay strong, steadfast, and solid on the rock. Let's bow our head for grace. Lord Jesus, thank you tonight, Lord, for coming in. You're bringing these men and women here to hear your Word, Lord. If it only affects a few, that's a few more than we would have affected without you and without them here tonight. Lord, we ask you to bless this food that may nourish their bodies, keep them warm and secure through the evening. But also, Lord, give them faith in you through the night. That they fear nobody, nobody on this earth, because you are with them. Lord, we just ask for all the blessings of Union Gospel Mission. And more than that, we ask that these men and women recognize the blessings that the Union Gospel Mission bestows upon them each and every day of the year. We ask all of this in the name of your glorious Son. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Enjoy your dinner. And if you stood up, please come up. If you stood up, please come up. There is no shame in your game. People What you do is you feel sorry for the people who don't come up that need to come up. Come on up here, guys. Right up here. We're going to take care of you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good tonight. Thank you for inviting us to be here. Lord's good. All the time.